everybody. Welcome to another webinar, webinar number 61 in yes. the series of copyright and online learning at a time of uncertainty. So I'm Chris Morrison. And I'm Jane Secker. And we are the co-chairs of the Association for Learning Technologies Copyrights and Online Learning Special Interest Group. We've got an exciting one for you today, we have. haven't we? It's going to be a really good session. So yes. let me just get yeah. those slides back up and we can um, explain a bit. Uh, it doesn't look like a particularly exciting slide here. But it shows that there are two items today, <laughs> copyright news and coming up next. So it is a copyright news special. We'll talk more about that and introduce our, our, guests, our, our special guests. guests in a moment. Yeah. Shall we, before we do that, say a little bit about what's been happening since we last? Yeah, met? yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. So this is two weeks ago, isn't it now, yeah. um, that we were in Cambridge at the LILAC conference, the Information Literacy Conference. Yes. And um, we we had a lot of fun, didn't we? We it did was, a session on podcasting for teaching and learning. I called it the Chatting Info Lit Pedagog Copies of the Waffle uh, mashup uh, at LILAC. So there were three different podcasting teams coming together to do one live podcast recording at the University of Cambridge. Um, I took all my toys with me didn't I it's all the toys it, but it was a brilliant conversation and um, really good to actually meet face to face the the chatting info lit guy so this it's a new podcast that is the new professionals of the information literacy group yeah um, and they've uh, they've released two episodes of their podcast I think this one's going to be the third one where they're talking to us as well as Mark Child who is one of the geniuses behind Pedagodzilla and we kind of talked about podcasting more broadly how it could apply to information literacy mm. played some silly songs talk a bit about copyright talked a little bit about copyright funnily enough but also more broadly about information literacy yeah um, and yeah it was great it was it was really good the only dampener I found out yesterday yeah uh, uh, I, I got a parking ticket from the parking at the hotel we'll have to deal with that another time oh no you don't need to go into that yeah I, I, I just need to have a little bit of crying out and get some tugging of the heartstrings. Oh dear. Yeah. Well that's teaching oh, to take all that audio equipment. There we go. It required an enormous van, a sort yeah, of articulated. It, it was a bit yeah. like when the BBC go out on tour, it wasn't it? Bit, with the amount of podcast. equipment that you were taking with you. Okay, so enough of that. Enough anyway. of that, yes. Um, but oh just to say that the so we did record that podcast. It's going to be the chatting info lit third podcast. So if you I would recommend you have a listen to that if you're involved in any way in information literacy it's yeah. really good and they're building up a, a you know a really good um you know basic entry into to being an information literacy professional definitely um, so we'll get a link in the chat in a moment won't and we? they look a bit like a fleet with mac oh, so they do yes absolutely uh, this is a reminder that the archive of webinars uh, recordings they're on our blog the copyrightliteracy.org blog as well as the youtube channel that's there yeah so again um we can share links in a moment but i think everybody here is pretty familiar with so. where those things are um we're wearing the ice pops t-shirts today we are we are from last year so this is yeah this is a reminder bookings are still open they're coming in bookings are still open still open. they're, they're going to be open for a while they're going to be open for a while they've actually they're only recently just opened they have yes. a reminder yes. when when's this taking place it is taking place on 19th to the 21st of july mm -hmm. at the university of glasgow um, and the main conference is actually going to be on the 20th um, of July, but we've got a pre-conference event which will be looking at sort of ebook issues, ebook licensing, organised by see our we colleagues have, at Create. We have Kenny Barr um, on the call today, so hello to Kenny, um, whose project is going to be you know, hosting that event, and that's going to be really fascinating. We've got. Um, Kyle Courtney, haven't we? We have. Coming from Harvard, who's going to contribute Somebody's to Alison asking if they get free t -shirts. I saw that, uh, yeah. Alison. I think we could we could probably, you know, do a deal on cheap, cut-price T-shirts. Cut-price right? T-shirts. Yeah. Well, I think we need we need a 2023 T-shirt, don't we? we? Do. What colour should it be? Yeah. Comments in the chat, please. We had grey for the first one, didn't we? We did, and yeah. Then we had red for the most recent one. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll have to get a Glasgow the t-shirt yeah know, green pink, white stripes gold blue. green yeah. yeah yeah there's many try yeah. to avoid the uh range of Char Celtic, chartreuse yeah. chartreuse yeah, I don't know. I well know if you're american it's chartreuse i don't even know what it's it's like color it's young color blind it's uh, like a pale green it's it's a liqueur oh made, okay it's like made by monks okay it's very nice yeah we'll get one of those thank you for that uh right should we move on from 
that they have all got some stuff yes. we're chatting. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, yes, our webinar evaluation survey. Um, I don't know if you can pop the link in the chat oh, to that. Um, sure we've can. had over 50 responses so far to um, what you think of these webinars. We've been doing them now since uh, 17th of March 2020. Um, if you want it to all stop, this is your chance to tell us. If you don't want it to stop, this is also your chance to tell us. Uh, um, so do fill in one of the, uh, the fill in the survey. Let us know what you think about the webinars. That would be really helpful. Slides have disappeared. Slides, again. slides have disappeared again. Once again, it's, gremlin, it's yeah. once again. I think the Gremlin Blackboard Collaborate. Um, yeah. It's uh, it always wants to throw us um, challenges, doesn't it? Right. In a moment, normal, normal service will be resumed. And in fact, uh, we are now on to the main event. So uh, let us play. <laughs> But it's not just copyright news, it's the copyright news special. So you made a new jingle for that. Uh, You're no, just going to play no, copyright no. news again. Let's play it again. Special, 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 special. Special with Matt Voigt from IFLA. Special with Matt Voigt from IFLA. Welcome, Matt. Hello. Hi, hi. Great to be here. <laughs> So good to have you uh, joining us. So um, I think we, we've mentioned, we've trailed the fact that you're coming on uh, the webinar. Uh, I think we've mentioned you in previous ones, uh, largely because um, we take many of the items from Copyright News actually from the newsletter. Shamelessly, you, shame, we shamelessly, shamelessly copy your Copyright uh, News. Uh, but, we, can, uh, uh, we can have an intellectual di property dispute over this right, uh, right in this episode if we wanted to. So. <laughs> Well, I think, that would be I think that's a good idea. Yeah, let, yeah, let's do that, perhaps. But perhaps before we get into that, um, can you, we'll, we'll have a bit of an introduction from you. Uh, can you first of all tell us, so you're, you're, you're working at the IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, um, and you're working in policy there. And one of the things that you do is, is put together this copyright news newsletter, which is fantastic. But can you tell us a little bit about what your role entails, what you've been involved in, because you've been there you've been there for a little while but it's a relatively recent position for you isn't it um yeah yeah i've been there a little over a year now so i am the copyright and open access policy officer there so we're a relatively small team it's policy and advocacy and uh, my role it's one part research uh on how copyright issues affect librarians around the world we of course have an international membership uh, so I'm in touch with libraries and library associations um, globally. Uh, it's one part advocacy in international forums. So I'm especially active at uh, at WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organizations, a standing committee on copyright and related rights, uh, which meets in Geneva once or twice a year. Um, so I speak at events like this. I uh, speak on behalf of libraries in those international policy forums. Uh, I work with members on copyright related issues, particularly the copyright and legal matters, copyright and other legal matters that we're still always deciding what the other legal matters are, um, committee <laughs> with IFLA, um, and also working on their open access related things. So one part wow. in talking to librarians, one part doing a bit of research and uh, one part international advocacy. Sounds like a fantastic job, Matt. Can you tell us a bit about, because you've got a background in uh, digital anthropology originally, haven't you? So can you tell us a bit about how you got into working in this area of copyright? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I have a master's in digital anthropology. I'm originally from the U.S., as you might tell from the accent. Uh, we uh, haven't, yes. Uh, we haven't. <laughs> Uh, some sometimes mistaken for British, uh, depending with this this Midwestern sort of tones. But uh, yeah. um, but um, I did my master's at UCL uh, in London in digital anthropology, and I did my PhD at University of Nottingham. So I lived in the UK for about. Oh, well, you are British then, basically. <laughs> by, by this point, you are. Well, not according to my passport, but you know, I, I could I could fake it. So, uh, um, but. Uh, but before that, when I was an undergrad uh, at uh, Warburg College in the U.S., I did a semester abroad in China. And uh, this was through that I had a bit of an opportunity to do uh, some research. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge movie fan at the time when I, th I thought I was going to China. I'm going to do some serious study. I'm not going to watch any movies for four months. 
And when I got there, I decided to systematize and to research what I found, which is which was that you know within a 10 minute walk of where I was staying in Kunming, um, I could get to 20 different DVD shops, each with a minimum selection of 2,000 unique titles selling for 60 cents a piece then. And this this was 2005. You know, yeah. so and basically what I found on that is okay, all these these are these are all pirate discs. They're being sold by these entrepreneurs. Um, you know, uh, China was manufacturing a lot of DVDs at the time, and you had some local entrepreneurs be like, "Okay, these don't have official releases. There's no way to get these movies, so let's just sell them in the street." And uh, this this shaped my outlook very much. That it was like, "Okay, well, if it wasn't for this process, these movies would not be practically available." And if you were a young film fan in China, you couldn't get a hold of the recent Oscar nominees, you couldn't get a hold of Citizen Kane. Uh, you know, if you didn't have this, this, this is the process that uh, that that is how it kind of sorted out. So uh, uh, someone posted uh, digital anthropology like the Facebook tribe. Um, I will say that uh, one of the things that digital anthropology tends to do, there is there is some branches of it that are like, we're gonna study online life, but the mm. UCL branch was pretty, uh, their thing was, uh, they started out as uh, material culture, which were these archaeologists who thought instead of studying like, uh, you know, old pots and pans and pottery that we, we, we dug up, let's, let's study how people use them in their houses today. And then they thought, okay, instead of, you know, studying these very material objects, you know, let's study something that has a reputation for immateriality like the internet. Yeah, uh, and they're much more about the idea is much more about how do you use this digital technology? How does it affect your offline life? So yeah. it's about kind of grounding that offline. Um, I uh, my master's dissertation on that was at uh, summer camps in America. I looked at how people use technology at summer camps, where you ostensibly go to get away from technology, and oh, then my wow. PhD yeah. was on how uh, refugees manage privacy on social me uh, social media. And in between, yeah. I've worked in marketing and uh, marketing and journalism. So, yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with it myself just because probably oh, 10, 15 years ago when I was at the LSE, um, we used a mm -hmm. video a lot from a, a, an anthropologist called Michael Vesh, who you might know, who does a lot about studying this kind of what it means to be human. And he did a, a sort of a, a, a study of his students of how much time they were spending online and made a video that kind of went a bit viral. Um, I'll try and dig it out and, and put it into the, the chat. But, you know, it was kind of about students, as you say, they're kind of online and offline um lives and this idea of students you know increasingly spending more and more time using technology spending time on their phones on facebook etc cetera, etc cetera, and what impact that has yeah excellent mike mike wesh is a fellow midwesterner he's i'm from iowa he's uh, based out of kansas uh, and he's definitely yeah, one of the leaders that. in the field there yeah 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 okay great uh, yeah and we're definitely going to pick up on um some of those threads definitely in some of the stories we're going to be covering because a lot of reports we see in the media about copyright issues I think often make assumptions about people's behavior and the way that people interact and the sort of cultural societal conditions so we'll definitely be digging into that before we do I know that we've got a um a question about you, you mentioned Facebook tribe is that a is that a term of art is that something you can explain to us what you mean or what is meant by that um, I, you know, uh, that that was posted in the chat. It's not a technical term, as far as I know, but uh, uh, you know, definitely, <laughs> you're, uh, you're, you know, anything can be a tribe. Anything can be a community, and uh, it's, yeah. it's, I think, a question of you know, what type of community. And I think you get it less now that I think uh, when I started this, when I started, you know, my master's, it was 2011, and mm -hmm. I think there was a lot more. Um, it was an earlier time in social media's history and there was still kind of a push to be like, you know, we need to legitimize this as a, as a site of so social interaction. You know, this is like an actual thing that people are doing online. You know, the phones are, it's, there's this idea that the phones are keeping us apart. And I think that's uh, become less prominent in popular discussion 
in recent yeah. years yeah. as people yeah. are much more aware of the fact that they're using their phones all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So things move on. And so to bring us into to the news, let's bring us into the, to the current day, the topic on everyone's list uh, or on everyone's lips, everywhere you go, everyone's talking about AI. Absolutely. It's, it's the big hot topic, moral panic, opportunity, end of the world, however you, you want to, to badge it. Um, so do you, are you able to just, you've got, you've, we've got some stories. There seems to be something new every day on, on copyright and AI. So, yeah. so what have you got for us? Um, yeah, yeah. So did you, uh, did you want to show the screen on these different stories that we talked about or should I be the one that shows that? Um, we could do, if it's, if it's the, if it's the, um, uh, the still ones, we could definitely bring them up. So give me a moment. Uh, so which one do you want to start with first? Is it the, uh, we got the EU legislation story, haven't we? Yeah, I think that's a good kind of springboard to uh, to discuss some some other things that are uh, uh, to discuss a lot of angles on that. So yeah, if you want to pull that up. Uh, so coming, now you can see this. So this is a, a story on the verge, isn't it? That reported EU legislation uh, to disclose AI training data could trigger copyright lawsuits. We'll just pop that yeah. one in the chat for you if you want to follow that up. But yeah, take it away, Matt. Tell us about this story then. Um, yeah, so I think this is this is interesting because uh, you know you're seeing uh, here the EU trying to uh, address some copy. There's a lot of copyright issues related to AI, as um, is, has been talked about this webinar, uh, you know, and is all over the news. And one aspect that this is trying to address is the data that goes into these machine learning training modules um you know these these uh because these these to train an ai you need a lot of content and you have to get that content from that somewhere and a lot of places that are training these models are using copyright content and this exists in a uh, there are a lot of different laws around the world. Some countries have explicitly put it into law that you can use these models. You can pump in the uh, the copyright data. You can put in whatever you want, use it to train. Others, there's restrictions on commercial use. Others have, have outlawed it all, all right. And I'll put in the chat here, uh, there's a group at American University, uh, PIGIP, uh, that I spend some time with them at uh, when we're in Geneva at WIPO, but they've done some good research, uh, if you want to follow that up, on what these laws are uh, around the world. And there's been a number of different ways to address that. Uh, I think the most interesting one, uh, the most interesting wording uh, is from Japan, where the, the wording in the law, and this is all English translation, of course, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it specifically sounds like in Japanese, but mm -hmm. It, it puts a limitation, it puts an exception in copyright law if you want to use it for, use the material for purposes not for enjoyment. So um, if you have, con if you, if you hate it and, you know, if you, if you hate the material and you don't enjoy it, I guess you can use it. Um, <laughs> But what they're uh, what they're they're saying there what what they're saying there is that you know if you're used that art is for some kind of engagement and if you're doing research or you're a machine you don't have an investment in these processes the the use is a different purpose so we're putting that in law that that you can use it for that so text and data mining the the exceptions are are fairly broad on that. Um, I think with this particular law that's uh, this particular. Um, bit that's being proposed in the EU, it, 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 it's an aim for transparency. It's an aim to say, all right, if you use this copyright content, let's identify that it's, it's been in use. Um, right, it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that it's going to directly lead to some legal consequences, but you wind up with some, some weird things like, uh, you know, you may have seen the, uh, uh, the images that were being produced that the machine learning had produced the Getty watermark on yes, the images yeah. themselves, you know that's that's a classic example there of uh, clearly this is this is copyright. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of compelling interest for using broader material in this because this data has to come from somewhere, and mm. 
if you're just using publicly available sources, they have all kinds of biases. Uh, one of the most, one of, as I understand, one of the more popular data sets to train on is a series of emails that were released uh, from the Enron Corporation um, in 2001 after the company collapsed due to all kinds of very colorful malfeasance uh, that you can look up. Um, you know, they, uh, there was a legal case and as a result, the emails became public and now it's a data set. You have several million emails from Enron that you can train your AI on, but you know, you're training on, on material from a bunch of sociopaths. So that's, that's yeah, exactly. like corrupt <laughs> corporate villains. Uh, <laughs> and that's who we want the, uh, the, the machines to, to uh, bottle themselves on. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll show well, I'll show you. Another... The, the, the... The case about um, so Getty are are kind of basically suing some of these image um, generating AI. So we've been experimenting a little bit in the, the team I work in with the one called Dali, and you know getting it to generate some images. Um, but obviously, you know, a company like Getty, pretty protective on their copyright, aren't they? Yeah. And similarly, you've also highlighted a story where the Universal Music Group. Uh, doing the same thing with music, say that they wouldn't hesitate to take steps to defend their access. So the, 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 the large content owners are clearly not happy and there are shots certainly being fired across the bows here. I'll put a link to that story in the chat as well. Well, I think the interesting thing here is, you know, you mentioned that Japanese law and the idea of, you know, not enjoying something, but typically in copyright debates, we've We've had this distinction, haven't we, between consumptive and non-consumptive use. That you know, if something is there to, uh, you know, if it's being read or listened to or somehow consumed by human beings, then copyright restrictions are there in order to to to, to regulate the access. But if it's the non-consumptive uses, it's the use of the text and data mining to do the research to understand within that data set. But it, it's now we're at this stage that was inevitably going to come. We all knew it was going to come where it's starting to to be kind of hybrid between that because it's the stuff is being consumed by machines. Um, they are then reproducing new works based on it. They're not just reproducing the works exactly as they were. Mm. Uh, but, but I think, as you pointed out, uh, Matt, the, the machine doesn't care, does it? <laughs> the machine does what it was built to do. Exactly. I mean, I think that's one of the problems with AI is the machine doesn't know and doesn't care about any of this stuff. It doesn't care about copyright. It doesn't care about truth. It, it doesn't have a conception of truth. So, you know, you can't really trust it to understand context, uh, whether that's about not producing infringing content or producing something where a degree of accuracy is important. You know, you ask, did this person commit a crime? Is this person alive? Please give me a bio of someone. And it, you know, it spits it out. It spits out a bio of someone who just doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. um, there was a bit in Twitter, there was a Twitter comment I read where someone said they were from, from a library and uh, a student came to them with a list of, uh, a list of articles to find. And they found out that the list had been machine generated and they were trying to find these articles that didn't exist. Because it I makes heard this... up, doesn't it? That is the thing. It yeah. makes up citations. I, I was playing with it and said, you know, write me an essay and put some citations in. And they're just entirely made up. There's, you know, it's, it's, it, it wrote a biography of me saying I'd written books I hadn't written that don't exist and things like that when I tried that as well. It's... Some, some of it, and it mixes that up as well. That's what I've seen. So, you know, it, it got the fact that Chris and I had written copyright and e-learning, but then it kind of created another book that we'd supposedly written. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be well, nice. It was nice. Didn't have to do any work. <laughs> it's, it's associating words with other words. And uh, yeah, yeah. It, it might get that you're working in the field of copyright, but uh, it doesn't understand why it would be important to get the precise title of something that you've written. It doesn't understand that you haven't written these books that it's talking about. It doesn't know what a book is. So mm. uh, as it turns out, all these things are quite important. Uh, you know, you may not think about them when you're you're talking every day, but it is quite important when, uh, you know, when you realize it's not happening. 
So yeah. Di Diane's also mentioned that the, her, the, the inquirer's team at Exeter have had some experience of these fake references. I guess it's really something, you know, librarians are going to just have to be have a heightened awareness of that, you know, before you spend hours and hours looking at, you know, how to find some stuff on a reading list, actually a couple of questions about where mm. did you get the reading list from in the first place, you know? It's, it, yeah. I think the thing I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that um, is what w the conversations we're having here about artificial intelligence within primarily educational and cultural heritage um, institutions are very much focusing on the ethics about what does this mean for us in our discourse and how people learn and how we express ourselves and how we create a, you know, a decent society. Um, from, from my view, it looks like most of the things that are coming from the certainly from the commercial organisations and looking at it from a legislative point of view and in the world of copyright are very much focused on the money, on who gets to make money off these things. I mean, is there something from the from the from the library sector, from the area you're in? Is, is there something missing in that public debate? And is this something IFLA are hoping to uh, somehow influence? Um, well, I think for um, I think for one, uh, it's it's uh, in these international policy discussions, like at at WIPO, um, when we're there, uh, there's a group of civil societies that were there, and we kind of act together, and we tend to be the ones that uh, bring up the other half of copyright law, the other half that's not about profit, but is about access and limitations and social mm -hmm. good. Um, yeah. But there is otherwise a kind of normative aspect in these conversations that's just like, well, the state of things is control and very intense rights management, and anything that uh, violates that is something we automatically have to do something about. So that sort of normativity happens in those discussions as well. But one of the heartening things that I've seen really about um, the recent, you know, I mentioned about Kind of where the conversation in digital anthropology what it was uh what it was really going against you know 10 years ago 15 years ago and i i've really seen just a huge number of facets of the discussion uh that you can find online about what ai is doing and what the implications are uh, right. and that includes you know are these ethical violations that this is all also includes can I offload some parts of my job that are just really formulaic, that are really prosaic? Can I offload that onto to AI? Can I use AI to write a first draft of a yeah, paper? Yeah. And I think yeah. if done carefully, you know, that's something where it, it, it really, there's a lot of potential there. Uh, if mm -hmm. not done carefully, then you wind up with just gibberish. You wind yeah. up with, uh, you know, a boss that that is just going to hire an AI to do the copywriting. And I mean, yeah. it's interesting you see in the uh, the writer's strike in Hollywood right now, there's some, I believe, provisions they're asking for in the new contracts that say that AI can't be used um, in the production of scripts. And I understand why they'd want something like that in there. But also, um, I think, uh, you know, I follow uh, Paul Schrader, the writer director is a quality Facebook follow. And he was saying something about, you know, I think his idea was that, uh, you know, you just still need to attach a human writer to it to get paid. And I think that might be a better situation there because there are a lot of ways you could use these tools in writing. And I think mm. being proactive and having these, and I say that as someone who's made a living writing, you know, mm. uh, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can work with this. And I think, you know, listening Absolutely. to- Absolutely, I think like the first draft when you're getting stuck with, you know, something- Or maybe even a short story. Maybe even a short story. Uh, is it time to share a little bit of the- uh, Yeah. I don't know if anyone's seen our latest blog post. Yeah, well- um, <laughs> It was something of a thought experiment, wasn't it? It was a little bit. So, I mean, yesterday, yesterday was uh, the uh, what they call Star Wars Day, May, May the 4th. It was May the 4th. Yeah. And um, we're, we're big Star Wars fans. And um, but actually, 
this this idea um, that the librarians are the kind of rebel alliance. I think it came out something we talked about. I, I think quite, it, I think I didn't think we I don't here. think we invented it. I think it's just something we've become slightly fixated. By. Yeah. So we 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 um, we, we basically. Um, well, like two weeks ago when we were at LIOC, we were in a session about chat GPT and AI and misinformation and all those kinds of concerns were being raised. And um, the, the, the presenter said something about, you know, oh, like, let's get chat GPT to write a story about rebel librarians. And I was actually I was using Bard and I thought, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to see what it comes up with. And it came up with a. The, the, year, the year is 2042. The world is a very different place than it was just a few decades ago. The rise of artificial intelligence and automation has led to mass unemployment and the gap between the rich and the poor has grown wider than ever before. In this new world, knowledge is power and those who control the information control the future. That's where the rebel librarians come in. They are a group of dedicated professionals who believe that everyone should have access to knowledge regardless of their ability to pay. They fight against the corporate interests that are trying to privatize information and make it exclusive to the wealthy. Um, so we won't. It goes really on. Yeah, we won't we, really it, goes, it goes on. But it does. It has invented a whole character. Um, Doctor Sarah Jones. Doctor Sarah Jones. Doctor yeah. Sarah Jones. If you're on this call, <laughs> we need you now. And he has this classically. It's a classic disaster movie setup. It is. Yeah, she's a brilliant librarian and a fierce advocate for open access. So fantastic story. It sounds a bit like Emily Trubinsky. <laughs> um, I, I think I think we we we, we should move on. We, we from should AI. move on from AI because we, it's we, the we, word on everyone's lips. But yeah. there are other things happening. Yeah. Um, yes. So the the, other, the next story that we were going to look at is about Z Library. Do you want to explain to us uh, what Z Library is slash was and what the situation is with that? Yeah, we'll pop the link into that one in the chat for people as well. So. Yeah, well, kind of, you know, kind of like LibGen, uh, which is, I think, with articles, uh, it's an online repository um, of books that completely disregards copyright restrictions. Uh, you know, if you want a book, you can you can find a copy of it there. Um, or at least you could. Now, I believe you have to go to the dark web uh, or you have to use Tor. Or you have to find ways around it because there was a complaint by the heart. I mean, it was, there was going to be a complaint somewhere, but this one was, was from the, uh, uh, the Harvard Business Publishing, and that led to the U.S. blocking it. And this raises all kinds of issues about inequalities in access because uh, you know, around the world uh, in institutions where it was not necessarily so easy to get a copy of a book, uh, you know, if the book was not released, if it was not released physically, if it was not released digitally, or even in the UK, in Europe, in America, if you're at an institution that is not as well resourced yeah, and yeah. take as the examples they used you know it's like well the library would take two months to get this book well i need to write my dissertation now and you know yeah. as someone who did a phd um you know all of this this adds up you know these little these little pieces where it's like oh there's a delay here there's a delay there and there is a huge difference between if you're you're in a place where something like an it issue can get resolved quite quickly or if it just gets deprioritized, and that's how you wind up going beyond your funding, that's how you wind up not finishing, that's how you wind up not getting publications necessary. So there are all kinds of ways that these are layers of inequalities uh, that add up, and one of them, of course, is access to books, and one way around that for a lot of people was using something like Z Library. Mm. And again, it's, you know, this is, I think there's an assumption in a lot of these policy discussions that we're going to sort things out uh, by providing access through these really structured means. And I think that doesn't really tell us about what happens when you, you step into reality, when you step outside of that and there's all kinds of ambiguities of, all right, I need the book now, but there's no digital copy, you know, or yeah. I need the book and I'm in the middle of, you know, I'm in the middle of a country, I'm in Nigeria, or I'm in Kazakhstan, or I'm in somewhere where it's it's not been built up as much. How do I get this? Um, so this and there, is course, similar, there's... isn't it, to the Sci Hub, isn't it? And the kind of 
the work, you know, that that uh, uh, Alexander Ale Abakian. yeah, yeah, has done <laughs> to sort of, you know, say that this is helping scholars around the world where they don't have access to this kind of content and highlighting, you know, some of the the, the barriers to knowledge. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, even I can say, like, uh, moving from the UK to uh, the Netherlands in mm. the middle of, it was, there was the move, but there was also Brexit. And when Brexit went through officially, then suddenly I found my access to um, uh, British Amazon channels cut off, my access to then HBO, and with it, access to huge amounts of catalogs of film. Uh, right. that were in definition that just have not been sorted out for a market like the Netherlands, where it's, you know, it's, it's obviously a, you know, it's, it's a country with, with money, but it's, it's a relatively small market. So no one's sorting out rights issues for world cinema classics. Um, I lost access to the, I think it was the BFI season on Japanese cinema from the 50s, you know, Ozu, Kurosawa, I love this stuff couldn't get it b movies from the 70s pff, you know no one no one's getting that sorted out so even in there um we i think there's a drastic overestimation um, overestimation of what material is available in different markets if you're looking for something really specific whether you're an individual or whether you're trying to work through a library yeah. Um, library system and again there are all kinds of things like cdl there all there are there are ways we can mitigate this you know and it's it's but the discussion of you know it's it's violation versus not violation uh it trips it up this is why we need flexible rules this is why we need options yeah. and, 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 and i did pick up on the um uh, the comment from the authors guild in in the us we are not unsympathetic to the plight of those college and other students who have perhaps felt forced to resort to such illegal pirate websites and other free sources of textbooks to help them manage the extremely high cost of higher education. However, these students' anger is misdirected. The exorbitant cost of education should not be borne by authors and publishers, but by universities. Mm. Uh, so, oh, Pass uh, in the buck. There we go. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a nuanced point, yeah. Rather than saying, yes, it's a complicated issue. Like, no, it's your fault. Um, I think that the thing I wanted to, to just comment on um, towards the end of this section is this isn't a new thing in some ways. Yes, it's new that over the last 10, 20 years, we've got access to this kind of material. Uh, but actually, in, in countries that, that don't have the funding and the resources, the, the unofficial means of getting hold of educational materials has long been a case. It, mm. you, you mentioned your, your experiences in China with sort of consumer access to DVDs. But say in India, there's been case law there that's been proven mm. that it is fair dealing to copy um, material that you know the official rights holder bodies are not happy with because, like you say, it, it meets it's the just real not world. Available, is and it? it's, yeah. it's not available and people need it. And where people need access to something, inevitably they'll be able to find access to it somehow. But not to say that we endorse any. As unofficial courses <laughs> on this particular yeah. webinar course it's uh shall, well. shall we shall we pick up um you know in the way that they do on news channels a, a lighter story now yeah. let's move to a, oh i love something a bit more like yes i it's it's only <laughs> friday bit, this yes. evening some of us might be enjoying a nice beer i believe you have a uh, light like, beer story yeah perhaps a bit <laughs> yes. too light what, what many of us think about american beer uh, over to you matt <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah so this was uh this was a story here um were you gonna pull it up or should i uh uh we'll, we'll, we'll grab the, yeah we'll uh, do that one yeah yeah you, you start and we'll, we'll we'll get flash up on the screen in a moment um yeah so this is uh you know this is a story of of cores and this this happened at the port in antwerp uh, i was just in antwerp a few weeks ago second largest port in port in europe and a private consumer in germany had tried to import um, some cans of Coors. Uh, I think it was around 2000. And uh, Coors has a slogan. The slogan has been there uh, since I believe 1906, calling itself the champagne of beers. And when it was tried to bring in these cans, it had something like champagne of beers on the, 
on the label, there was a complaint law lodged by the Committee Champagne, the you know that has the regional protection on um, Champagne, and uh, they ordered them not imported, and the cans were destroyed. So, um, you know, this is these these regional protections are something that you know uh, at least when they started coming into place, uh, I believe it's 1995. Uh, again, this is quite a long time. This is like you know, 90 years after uh, Coors was calling itself the champagne of beers. You know, this was something that Americans kind of made fun of. You know, it's the constant online meme of, you know, it's not, it's not real whatever if it's not from the whatever region of France. Now it's just sparkling. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I think there's some interesting things and I tried to look up a bit about the regional protections and what they're technically legally protecting. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's obviously protecting the brand integrity. It's something like a trademark. Um, it's preventing association, but uh, association with things which are not your product. Uh, but right. at the same time, it's, it's a weird sort of wording because champagne of beers uh, suggests that it, it's not claiming to be champagne. It's claiming no. to be like champagne quality for a beer. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I, no one disputed this. And if it was disputed, I think you could have had some interesting disputes. Um, I, I hope that Coors starts billing itself as being banned in Europe. I think that would be quite, uh, quite <laughs> funny. But again, you know, Coors, the thing is though, Coors, um, you know, when it was calling itself this like way back when right now when i think of Coors, i think of an american light beer uh yeah. not unlike Bud light and these are these are beverages that as you mentioned are are not terribly well regarded today uh not in yeah. the era of, of craft beer you know no, they, they, they really don't taste of anything do they i mean they're, they're, they're largely they're sort of one step away from being sparkling water but they they are alcoholic yeah, yeah, there's, a, and this had to do with like legal restrictions around uh, making making the beer only 3.2% alcohol, uh, which had to do with uh, some prejudice against German immigration back in the day. Um, and but it, it's it's like this does get into intellectual property in that, like the American light beer started to come into being in the late 1800s, when you had these brewing companies trying to upscale. All this was happening at the same time. And at, at that time, one of the challenges of upscaling was producing a consistent beverage and also producing something that was clearly labeled. Uh, because a lot of play, if you had a good reputation for beer, you know, someplace would buy your beer and then they'd run out and they'd start packaging uh, a, a gutter swill that they brewed in their own basement under the same name. So this American light beer, this upscaling, this standardization, it's all really happening at the same time that Coors is also starting to call itself the champagne of beers. So this all goes back to around IP around the early 1900s, um, you know, at least in, in America, late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, the challenges they had then, and now we're over in Europe and it's a different context. It's all a bit muddled, but there's a book, uh, Maureen Ogle is the author, um, um, Ambitious Brew, the story of American beer that talks all about this. Well, so some light could, reading. Yeah, some, some, some cause light reading. Some some but, light, light yeah. reading. Um, there, there are there are other, other beers available. I, I like to mention that the Curious Brew that's brewed here in Kent actually, I believe, uses champagne yeast in mm. the. Oh, the they don't call state. it the champagne. They don't. Beer. No, no, they no. Dare. It's nice. Perhaps people can share their favourite drinks. They don't have to be alcoholic. Um, in the chat, and that can get us ready for what we might want to. Uh, later on seeing as it's friday Absolutely. and it's a bank holiday weekend yes yeah so i mean we're we're kind of we're heading towards the end of our time copyright news could obviously have been an extended sort of two hour special but yeah. i'm conscious that people will have lunch, we'll be getting off lunch. To to. but there is a big copyright story that's going around um well the world but particularly in the uk media at the moment um about everybody's favorite talented musician not chris Mar morrison actually no, no, really. not no but case. it's ed sheeran so um 
we like to we like to talk about copyright and music on these webinars as well. So uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about um, what's what's happening um, in in the music world and Ed Sheeran and the recent case. Well, Ed Ed Sheeran has won the case, so he is no longer on the hook for uh, um, violating Marvin Gaye's. Uh, um, intellectual property claims, though he was, of course, in court, uh, um, saying a number of uh, a number of a number of things that were, uh, you know, quite passionate about, uh, you know, the building these chord progressions that he was using, being the building blocks of music, and you can't copyright that specifically. I think this is all quite standard rhetoric that we we often use in policy spaces as well. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that I haven't quite seen reported as much on this that might be some useful context is that the Marvin Gaye estate is a bit litigious. Um, mm. They previously, I believe, sued, uh, they sued Pharrell and uh, Robin Thicke for um, the song Blurred Lines. And they did, they, yes. didn't, yeah. they didn't claim, and this was, they won this, and I think this is very badly decided, but they didn't claim they used a sample. They didn't uh, claim that they, use the same progression. They claimed it was a vibe. They claimed that they copied the vibe from this. Mm, and mm. it wasn't fixed, and yet somehow they won that case. So, mm. so you know, they've done that before, and that time they won, and that was 2018, and, uh, and this time they lost. Yeah, absolutely. I think in that case, I mean, in, in this particular action, it wasn't actually Marvin Gaye's estate. It was Ed Townsend's estate, one of the co-writers, one oh, of the co-writers. Oh, okay, okay. sorry, sorry for mistake on that. No, 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 I, no, I no, have no, this mostly, so you that, probably... What we actually have, though, is the same people behind it. I think it's the same lawyers. It's certainly the same. Yeah. And it's, in, in my view, it's the classic where there's a hit, there's a writ. Uh, <laughs> and that inevitably, if someone's very successful, there's lots of money to be made. And I, I personally, I mean, I follow a lot of um, sort of music nerds on YouTube. I've got uh, uh, a link to a video putting in there. Adam Neely is one of the best music... Uh, YouTubers and he talks about music theory and plagiarism and these copyright cases uh, very coherently and, and very accessibly even if, if you're not into music and I'm I'm, I'm gonna be self-indulgent here but the thing that he points out um, if I can get the guitar here that in that particular case what we're what we're talking about is it's like a it's a con the chords that you've got to play with particularly if you're working in a particular genre and in this case we're talking about a pop soul ballad they're both two pop soul ballads you've kind of got chord one two three four five six and then you've got seven and then back to the same chord so you've only got that many chords and what is happening in the Ed Sheeran song is he's got this kind of That's, that's the groove that they seem to be saying is the same as in the Marvin Gaye one is, which is a different chord because that's F sharp minor, not that one, which is chord one in the first inversion. So there's a different chord, it sounds kind of similar, but the melody is different, the songs are clearly different. The fact that he did a mashup where he used the, you know, the melody of Let's Get It On, it's just something that happens, you can just do with pop songs because the reason why Ed Sheeran's songs sound like other people's songs is because he's working in a tradition of accessible pop songs. I think I think it's a good, but yeah, I would. He said he was going to give up music if he'd lost the case. Yeah. I, I might have had to give up making uh, novelty copyright songs if that if, if he lost the case <laughs> as well. I'm not sure I would be bothered to make that level of statement. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So it's well. I mean, hopefully, what we've given people today is some, you know, topical kind of copyright stories. So it's always good to have some of these, be able to yeah. talk to them in, uh, you know, talk about them as a librarian um, in when you're running training. I think the kind of key thing for me was always, you know, where, where's the hook when you're trying to get people to come and engage with copyright? I don't know if you have any kind of insights to sort of end with, Matt, you know, like working. You know, librarians have got quite a hard challenge, haven't they? I think really, as uh, when they're sort of setting themselves up as experts around copyright, but also people that that are kind of going out and advocating as well. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, obviously, as as librarians working in copyright, uh, as well, people working around that field, whatever our job titles are, uh, there's some really practical stuff that we try and advise 
people on. But at the same time, there's a lot out there that I think does get people's interest. Like uh, I recall someone visited our, our office one time. They wanted to talk to different members of staff and, you know, they talked to me about copyright. And what I started talking about uh, eventually as I got around to it was about comic books and was about how writers of, you know, you have these comic book characters that have been running for decades and decades. And how do you sort out the rights for a particular aspect of a character that sticks? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like um, the iteration of the Joker in Batman that was, uh, you know, written in, uh, was it Denny O'Neill, I think, wrote in the 70s that really influenced the character, Alan Moore's version, The Killing Joke. You know, you get these aspects that just get picked up out of thousands and thousands of issues that are published. And the way that's typically been handled is, you know, the rights just get signed over to the company and the company manages that. And then if you're a writer that produced a particular or an artist who produced a particularly influential thing, you're just out of luck. Uh, and this really stuck with this person because her, uh, you know, her daughter had, uh, or her son, I believe, had uh, you know, he worked in illustration and he created an illustration for a particular campaign and they were still using it. And uh, so th these connections and these sort of larger stories and these more pop cultural stories, I think there's there's a lot of hooks that interest people. And Definitely. there's also just a lot of stuff going on. And of course, AI is a endlessly much as AI itself is endlessly generative, um, the discussion around AI is endlessly generative as well, if you want to follow mm. implications. Mm. And again, I so, think it's in a much more sophisticated place than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah, and so if people want to keep up to date, you have um, a, a list, don't you, which um, you'd be really happy for any members, anyone attending the webinar today who's not signed of up. Tell us a bit about the list, yeah? Um, yes, yeah, so it is the list for, um, again, part of my work with IFLA is with the Copyright and Other Legal Matters Committee. And the Copyright and Other Legal Matters Committee has a mailing list. Um, mm -hmm. And I started using that to send out the weekly copyright news mailings. So you do get other mailings, other bonus mailings as, as a part of this, but the copyright news has become the most consistent feature of mm. that mm. so um you're completely welcome to sign up for that i believe the link was in the uh story uh the new story yes, I think in the blog post yeah i can see if i can pull that up uh, as well okay that would be great that would be great it's been fantastic hasn't yes, it it's almost thank you, yeah thank you yeah. so much matt that was so brilliant and perhaps um perhaps we can have you back on the webinar another time to, to do another oh. copy review I'd love to be here. So uh, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's I, I, our, our roving reporter. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So uh, hopefully everybody's found today really useful. We'd welcome your feedback. Um, and if you've got any other kind of key copyright topics that you'd like Matt to talk about, if you'd like us to talk about, <laughs> then just drop us a line, fill in our survey. Yeah. Um, we, we've got um, some, uh, we've got a webinar coming up in June. We, we have. It's, so to say on that, I mean, there, one of the stories that Matt highlighted recently, there are things that are happening in streaming media and in the, the wider uh, broadcast world. So related to that is our, um, if I, these slides just keep stopping sharing, don't they? That we have next week, uh, not next week, next month, um, the launch of the Code of Fair Practice for the Use of Audiovisual Works for Film Education, the work that had, many of you have been waiting for yep. for some time, that Jane and I have done with Bart Maletti for Learning on Screen, um, and we're getting ready to do. And the code is going to come out. The code out. is going to be coming out, so we're really looking forward to sharing that. With we are you. going to be talking about it at Ice Pops as well. We so are. anyone coming to yes. Ice Pops? Ice Pops, don't forget about Ice Pops. May we get a printed copy of the code. Yeah, possible, but we need to be mindful of the environment. Oh, right, yes, yes. Uh, we'll be taking a break for July and August, but we're not really taking a break because Ice Pops is happening in July. Absolutely. Um, yeah. August, we probably are, I yeah. think, to a certain extent. Uh, future topics to be confirmed, but we are planning on uh, perhaps a session looking at copyright and ethics in learning technology. So picking up on some of those things, 
that we talked about around artificial intelligence, but more broadly about the, the um, uh, ethical framework that uh, the Association for Learning Technology have put together and yeah. how do we look at that with a copyright uh, And I'm also, I've been in discussion with um, a, a, some colleagues who are working on projects around open textbooks. So I think mm, in the oh, autumn, yes. yeah. we, we should have a, a, well, over the summer, we'll get an up-to-date schedule for our autumn webinars, but we're definitely looking to have a, one on open textbooks. Yes, and don't forget, um, if you're not aware of it already, um, that at Ice Pops in July, we are having an AGM annual general meeting of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. So there's an opportunity to find out from you face-to-face uh, what it is you're looking for from these webinars or from the group more broadly so Absolutely. really looking forward to seeing you there yeah. so uh, thanks again for everyone for coming and for yeah Matt thank for joining you so us. much Matt we we have, have applause for Matt yes, and everyone round of applause. well done Matt excellent um we have one last thing we often do this is a sort of follow-up for those of you that are still on the call um you know that we uh had uh or oh, I'm a huge Beatles fan <laughs> we spoke to Beatles expert Mark Lewison for our uh, podcast last year, yeah, year before last, last time year. ago now. Um, this is a follow-up, something that, that we found out about just the, a couple of days before it was due to be announced from Mark, that um, the journalist Samira Ahmed, um, who works for uh, BBC4, uh, Radio 4, Front Row, um, got this amazing scoop of this undiscovered um, live recording of the Beatles from Stowe School back in 1963 and the it's a it's a brilliant program uh, we recommend you if you're interested in the Beatles at all that you could listen to the uh, the Radio 4 uh, piece but there's also here a link to Samira's own website and also a podcast um, I am the egg pod in which he talks about there's a question about the copyright implications of it mm. so there is a copyright angle on it and we had a quick chat with Mark about you know how this might be used an undiscovered tape mm. could it be broadcast by the bbc how does you know who owns the rights in that um it's a live recording they you know it was made by uh the, a pupil, I think, the pupil the who school, actually arranged the concert so yeah. I think he felt that yeah. it was his right to make that recording yeah um so it's something that we are really interested to see what happens to it we believe that is well the recording has been given to a uh, institution it needs to be tight, cleaned up, but you can hear clips of it on that recording. So there we go. Some Beatles nerdery if you want to follow up on that over the weekend. Yeah. Um, so. so thank you very much to everybody again. And let's have a bit of the old.